Welcome to the Proceedings Podcast. I'm Bill Hamlet, the Editor-in-Chief of Proceedings at the U.S. Naval Institute. Today is Friday, TGIF, Friday, March 22nd. And in this episode, we're going to recap some significant naval news with Sam Legrone from USNI News. But first, today's episode is brought to you by Booz Allen. Accelerate today's missions with tomorrow's technologies as the leader in providing AI solutions to the federal government and one of the world's largest cybersecurity providers. Booz Allen advances game-changing capabilities rapidly, ethically, and securely. Learn more at boozallen.com slash defense. All right, let's get right to it with Sam Legrone. Sam, welcome back to the show. Hey, glad to be here. All right, so it, it's an understatement to say it's been a busy week for the news, for the your team. Uh, lots going on both operationally and programmatically. Uh, so let's start with U.S. forces that are headed to Gaza to help with the, the humanitarian aid mission. Yeah, let me try that again. The humanitarian aid mission uh, off the Gaza Strip. Uh, so talk about the Army watercraft and the Naval Beach Group and other naval forces and how they're going to be used when they when they get there. Sure. So last week I took two trips through the swamps of Virginia to go check out the uh, operation that was announced by um, President Joe Biden during his State of the Union address that the U.S. Uh, military is going to build a humanitarian pier on the Gaza Strip, allowing a vector for uh, aid to come in outside of the trucks that are at the border and then the airdrops that uh, U.S. Central Command keeps doing. Um, so the idea would be that you would move 2 million uh, meals a day from uh, unspecified ports. We think it's Cyprus uh, with Army watercraft to this pier and the kind of the, the, the underlying message and the underlying promise from the Biden administration was no boots on the ground. No U.S. troops will be in Israel. So, um, so far, there are two units that are designated to go. It's the U.S. Army's uh, 7th Battalion, uh, 7th Transportation Battalion Expeditionary. It's a um, unit underneath the 18th Airborne Corps. And so they're based at uh, Joint Base uh, Fort Eustis or Joint, Joint Base Langley, Fort Eustis, uh, kind of in between uh, Richmond and uh, Newport News. Um, so we went there uh, last week to go see the Army watercraft off. So these are flat bottom boats. They draft about 12 feet or so. They top out at about 10 knots and they're designed to do this joint logistics over the shore operation where um, they have these kind of Lego Lego type um, sections of pier. They call them the modular causeway system and then you can load them up on trucks. You can load them up on train cars. And um, when you get to the other end of where you need to go, you can build a pier you could build uh, kind of a floating staging area. They call it a roll-on, roll-off discharge area where you can go and assemble all of your stuff from your larger draft ships out in the sea and then use Army watercraft to go and take them into shore on a pier. So uh, seven TBX loaded up um, a MARAD ship, a Maritime Administration uh, Ready Reserve ship called uh, Roy Benavidez. Uh, which just a few years ago had been transferred from the Navy to MARAD with these modular components so they could go and build the pier. And that left yesterday from Newport News. So they floated these big chunks of pier 18 miles down the river from Fort Eustis down to the Newport News, Port of Virginia Terminal. And they loaded them up with cranes, uh, got on board the ship uh, last week, talked to the master. Um, they had about five days warning. Him and the chief engineer were on vacation and they were like, guess what? load up, we're going to the Eastern Mediterranean. So that's the Army group, that's 7TBX. So they've had a series of watercraft that have departed. They're doing a very long Atlantic transit. It's 30 days at 10 knots in a flat bottom boat in the spring in the Atlantic. I think uh, your, your your viewers and your listeners know, know what the implications are. Uh, one of the chief warrant officers uh, who was uh, the chief engineer on the, on the lead ship uh, said, uh, hey, I got to pack Dramamine every time. You know, half the time I'm, I, I gotta I gotta brace my hand up against a bulkhead to keep from falling over. Yeah, and they're and they're taking they're they're, they're not doing the great because of the weather. They're not doing like the great circle route, right? They're they're going a more no. southerly transit. Right, they're, they're they're doing a southerly transit, and it's going to take them about a month to get over there. So all told, we're not going to have the army's not going to be there, and they're not going to have the pier assembled for about sixty days from last week. So it about it's going to take about another. 
um, 50, 60 days for them to assemble the pier. The Navy's contribution, um, they're coming from Jacksonville. So Navy Beach Group 1, which is uh, based out of San Diego, has a bunch of uh, gear that is pre-positioned on ships in Jacksonville, Florida. So they have gear pre-positioned in the Pacific and they have gear positioned in Jacksonville. So they're taking two uh, other uh, container ships, or I'm sorry, not container ships, two cargo ships, the, the Lopez and the Bobo, and they're going to sail them across with the Navy gear. And so what the Navy is going to do is with their gear, which is very similar to the Army's, is they're going to build kind of a floating pier two miles off the, the, the coast of Israel. And that's where the cargo uh, from the humanitarian mission that is screened in Cyprus, we think, is going to come. And then that's going to get transferred over to the water craft from the Army. And then the Army is going to ferry that to the pier that they build in Gaza. Again, no boots on the ground. There's a lot of open questions, right, as to... How does your force protection work? Uh, who is going to be on the other side to actually tie off the pier and put a stake in the ground to make sure it doesn't float away because you can't put boots on the ground? So a lot of those are still open questions. I mean, down to how does the command and control for this work? Because Israel is in the Mediterranean, right? So ordinarily, that would be under the domain of U.S. European Command and uh, NAVIR uh, uh, Naval Forces Europe, uh, Africa, out of Italy. However, uh, within within not too long, in the not too distant past, Israel is now part of U.S. Central Command, which is the, the Middle East Command. So there's some question as to how this is going to work, who's going to be in charge of what part of the operation, and then um, who is the partner on the other side. I think the U.S. has said that they are not going to work with Hamas, well, does that mean that's IDF? That means there's some NGO. I think um, NBC, our colleagues over at NBC News said that the Israeli government was contemplating doing a private security group, um, uh, whatever, like whatever Blackwater is called now. Um, and so there's there's still a lot of moving pieces. So I think from the people that we talked to, I think half of them are sort of excited that like, hey, we have we have an organization that's biased towards action and they're doing something. And about the other half is is sharing a lot of concerns that like, hey, there's a lot of open questions in this operation right now. Yeah, so uh, seam between UCOM and CENTCOM, 6th Fleet, 5th Fleet there, uh, a big seam where you've got a, a floating pier, uh, it's something tied up to the beach in Gaza, but no U.S. boots on the ground. So how do you, how do you tie it up? How do you secure it? Will there be Will there be American service members on the pier, but not on the beach? Yeah, as you point out, lots lots of questions yet to be answered. Yeah. I, yeah. So, I mean, what happens, you know, I mean, I think, you know, we're just kind of spitballing the other day with some colleagues. I think what's the worst case scenario? A soldier gets kidnapped by Hamas. What's the second worst case scenario? Like some civilians end up getting killed um, trying to rush the pier. I mean, there are, there are a lot of ways this can go sideways. Yeah, and then and then that's not even uh, counting the, uh, the the potential for real bad weather. You know those uh, those systems that joint logistics over the shore, uh, floating pier and and things that are tied up to the shore. When when you get heavy weather uh, in the East Med, which often happens because the, the the prevailing winds tend to blow that way. You know the, it can get a little hairy. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, let's move on to the second topic I wanted to talk to you about today, uh, and that is shipbuilding in the Navy budget. The The president's FY25 budget dropped a couple of weeks ago, and you guys have covered that. And then the 30-year shipbuilding plan came out this week. What are some key takeaways for the future of the Navy uh, from, from those two documents? Sure. So let's start with the budget. Um, so the budget, uh, as always, comes with a five-year outlook of what the Navy uh, wants to buy, that's usually a pretty realistic assessment. So I think the probably the biggest takeaway um, from this Navy's budget is that amphibious shipping is back in those plans. So this was a big um, kind of three-way uh, struggle between the Pentagon, big Pentagon, the Navy, and the Marine Corps as to what is the appropriate number of amphibious ships, L-class ships, that you need to go and sustain the Marine Corps. So the Marines were very adamant. The Marines, as we all know, are very, very good at uh, communicating with Congress. They have been for years and years and years and years and years. 
uh, as to what their intentions are. And so the Marines were very adamant about we need 31 ships is a minimum. And so General Berger, the former commandant of the Marine Corps, uh, now General Smith, um, the current commandant of the Marine Corps, are very adamant about the fact 31 ships is the minimum. And you you saw a lot of uh, rhetorical um, arguments from the Marines last year, especially uh, when you had some of the humanitarian crises that were going on in Sudan. For example, um, there was not an argmu, right? Uh, amphibious ready group, Marine Expeditionary Unit, um, you know, the floating three ship formation that goes to places and uh, puts Marines around if they need them, evacuates people if they need them. There's a whole, there's a whole uh, um, sort of a doctrine that the Marines are very uh, quick to tell you that they are there to make sure that um, they have the option to go and put forces ashore and then take people off if they need to. Um, the Marines made quite a meal of that, uh, not having uh, those ships around Sudan uh, at the time. Uh, and, you know, the, the ongoing conversation between OSD and Navy um, led to, all right, we give up. We're going to start building LPDs again. So San Antonio, there's a San Antonio Flight 2. A and uh, the long range shipbuilding plant is committed to a baseline of 31 amphibious ships. So that was that was probably a big win for the Marine Corps. The other thing that sort of stood out to a lot of people was the uh, the U.S. Navy is only buying one uh, Virginia class attack submarine this year. It's the first flight six. Or I'm sorry, first block six Virginia class attack submarine. Um, and usually that's a two year thing. So the submarine industrial base has probably caused more concern than any other sort of shipbuilding topic uh, in the last couple of years. So you have um, the submarine industrial base as it stands built between two shipyards. You have General uh, you have General Dynamics Electric Boat up in uh, Groton, Connecticut, and then you have Newport News uh, shipbuilding uh, by HII down in Newport News, Virginia. So the way that works and breaks down is the uh, EB uh, electric boat up in Connecticut, they build the the barrel of the submarine, right? They build the central component, the central sort of uh, hull of the submarine for both the Columbia class and then the Virginia class submarines. And then um, you have HII and they build sort of the front ends, right? They, they build the bows and then they build the sterns and then they barge them back and forth between the two yards to assemble them together. And that's worked out pretty well so far. That was a teaming arrangement that was made back in the 2000s when the Virginia program got going uh, and it's worked out okay. Now, instead of delivering two submarines a year, and it was the Navy's most successful shipbuilding program for quite some time, but the fragility of the submarine base um, kind of uh, was exposed and some, some trends were accelerated by uh, the lockdown and the pandemic, uh, where you have a lot of older workers getting out of the game, you had supply issues, you had uh, quality of life issues in certain yards for some people, and you saw a contraction of the workforce, you saw a contraction in the supplier base. And now all of a sudden, instead of delivering two submarines a year, you're delivering 1.3 submarines a year. And that is coming as the Australians are getting involved with nuclear submarines as part of the Australia, UK, US agreement. Um, and in order to meet all of the obligations that the US uh, needs to make into that agreement, they need to be building 2.33333 submarines a year. It's a lot of wind up. I promise this is going somewhere. So the um, not buying two submarines a year kind of raised a lot of eyebrows with some people. And I think the Secretary of the Navy, uh, Carlos del Toro, would argue uh, when they made this decision uh, that, hey, the order books for HII and uh, GD are stocked, we can go and take this submarine out of this plan right now because they have so much orders already stacked and they're so behind on, they're already on their deliveries that we're gonna put more resources into advanced procurement and then stabilizing the submarine industrial base. So as a part of the long range shipbuilding plan, you have about 17.5 billion ish in submarine industrial base support. Um, and we're trying to get some more specifics, but they really want to go and make sure that uh, not only with new construction, but with like existing submarines, they can go and get after some of this maintenance stuff. Got it. So uh, that's, uh, you, you mentioned 2.333, that's uh, fast attack submarines. That, that's the aspiration for fast attack boats per year. And then add to that 
one Columbia class per year that are supposed to be coming online as well. So we're, we're, was there any change in the shipbuilding, uh, the, the, the shipbuilding projection for 30 years or in the budget related to Columbia class? No, uh, the, uh, we did report, however, so the Secretary of the Navy has just completed a 45-day uh, shipbuilding review. Uh, Secretary Del Toro has been pretty tough on the shipyards right now. And so he took, um, with a brand new uh, chief acquisition uh, official in the Navy now, um, Secretary Gurton, uh, Nicholas Gurton, who just was the CAPE director, uh, they did a 45-day shipbuilding review. It's like, well, we just need a status update on everything. Um, so a lot of our questions around budget time were, uh, you go, hey, wait for the 45-day review to come out. Well, one of the things that we found out was that the Columbia class submarine, which is the not only the Navy, but the Pentagon's number one acquisition priority is late. And it's gonna be late maybe by a year. And that is that is uh, one of the things that the Navy and the Pentagon really did not want to happen because the way that these deterrent patrols are constructed, um, the Columbia was gonna come online heel to toe when the Henry M. Jackson which is the first uh, SSBN to, to get decommissioned, comes out of inventory. And then the uh, District of Columbia could slide right into that slot. Now that schedule is getting pushed a year. Um, and there the Navy's going to have to start asking some hard questions about how that's going to ripple through the rest of the submarine force. So that's the number one priority, again, for the Pentagon is not only the Navy, but the Pentagon is to get that right. And so everybody's scrambling to try and figure that out. Um, based on our reporting, uh, the two things that have come up are uh, the bow assembly coming out of HII is taking some time, taking longer than they thought. So again, in this teaming arrangement with Electric Boat, Electric Boat is building the, the central part of the submarine, uh, including the missile tubes that are gonna carry the Trident II D5 um, ballistic missiles. And then um, HII is responsible building for building the stern portion and then the bow the stern just delivered in january the bow is late and uh it's a it's a new type of construction or it's not a new type of construction but it's a new um component build for hii because it's essentially the old ohio bow dome but they never built the ohio bow dome so there's that's taking longer the other component is the steam turbines that uh take the steam from the nuclear reactors and then turn it into uh, energy for the rest of the ship is, is taking longer than they expected. Uh, and that's government furnished equipment. And so that's, that's on the Navy to go and make sure that they can go and get that built and delivered in time. Because there's, you know, when you're building the barrel of the submarine, you need those pretty early to get those in there because it's, it's difficult to, to put those in these, these massive pieces of hardware in a pretty tight uh, construction configuration. Uh, fascinating and and troubling because I know that uh, for the last what at least three CNOs in a row now we've been hearing from Admiral Richardson and Admiral Gil Gilday and now uh, Admiral Franchetti that uh, the Columbia class is our number one priority and it cannot slip we cannot delay with this thing so uh, a year long delay as you said puts all sorts of perturbations in in ship schedules and things. Um, Let's move on, move on a little bit more uh, about shipbuilding. So we're hearing that uh, the Constellation class frigates are behind. Now the future USS Enterprise, which is the a Ford class carrier, is going to be 18 months late. You reported on that this week. And then the Navy budget, well, you already talked about the, uh, the, the one fast attack submarine. So uh, aside from the, the broader, uh, you know, the submarine issue. What, what else is happening with uh, with shipbuilding? Well, the Constellation class frigate, which is the new um, small combatant for the Navy that comes in after the uh, the LCS um, finishes their run, is getting built up at uh, Fincantieri Marinette Marine, which is a yard up in uh, Wisconsin. So um, it's a it's a yard that is uh, having a hard time uh, retaining a workforce. Um, Based on a story that we wrote in January, um, the first Constellation, uh, USS Constellation, was supposed to deliver um, in 26. Now that looks like it's going to be 27 or later. And I think a big part of that is going to be the workforce and getting that established. Also, it's a unique ship because it was based on a parent design. So 
think all the way back to 2015, um, the uh, the late Senator John McCain was very um, negative on the LCS program uh, and wanted a wanted the Navy to look at a new ship. And sort of based honestly on his force of will, uh, jump started uh, a new frigate program. And the idea on how it was supposed to work, it was based on a parent design. And so the parent design for this frigate is the French Frem which is built by uh, Fin Cantieri, uh, which is an uh, um, anti-submarine warfare frigate, which also has some guided missile components. Uh, you know, it's, it's a multi-mission frigate, but, you know, like most frigates, it's designed for anti-submarine warfare. Yeah, the French um, the French and the Italian navies both have the, the Frem class. Mm -hmm. yeah. Nice the, ship. The French Frem. Yeah, yeah, they're great. Uh, the French Frem, I, I have been told, is the superior ship. But um, no, no offense to our Italian friends. Um, the but that design had to go through NAVC, and the biggest difference between European designs and American designs is the the level of survivability that American ships have to have is so much greater than European ships. So you have to touch almost every single drawing. So you have this parent design from the ship that's already existing, but it's almost depending on who you talk to, it's almost an entirely new ship design when it comes out the other end. And then you have um, some pretty rigid naval sea system command standards that they have to go and adhere to. So you have that design component on top of the fact that Finn Cantieri, who has, who has been successful building the Freedom Class um, literal combat ships, is now building a new ship class. They also have um, are building uh, a series of four multi-mission uh, surface combatants for the Saudis uh, as part of their... Um, uh, naval, uh, their, their Eastern Naval upgrades. Um, and so those ships are also in the yards and then you have the old freedom classes. So there's a, there's a bunch of stuff going on over in the yards already. And then you have sort of a, a workforce, um, issue because, um, rural Wisconsin, unless you're into the Green Bay Packers or the outside could be a, it can be a tough place to live. So there's a, there's a retention issue they have, they have over there too. So that's all combining to pushing this, this frigate, which, is a particular priority of uh, Secretary Del Toro back further. Got it. Well, go then, Packers, but but uh, yeah, it is. Uh, no, it, no, 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 <laughs> go Packers, go go Bears, <laughs> go, go Bears. Bears. Uh, it, it's cold as heck up there in the winter time, and so yeah, e even inside a shipbuilding hall, it's uh, it's not easy to, to to do that to bend steel. Um, I, I wanted to go back just real quick. Uh, you mentioned the LPD San Antonio class and the, the, the fact that there had been a hold on building those ships and now the new budget has, has broke forward. So there's a, there's another one. Are, is the plan to do one every other year? I got to look at the build rate. It's not, it's not coming immediately to me, but the idea is I want to say it's one every three years. Okay. Um, so those are built down at uh, Ingle Ship Building down in Pascagoula, and they've been doing those. They've been they've been chunking those out uh, in in a serial manner for for a long time now. So it's a, it's been a pretty successful ship class for them. So now that they have the demand signal, um, they're gonna they're gonna move and probably not have a ton of problems getting those out the door. Gotcha, gotcha. All right, uh, I want to wrap up um, in the life well lived category. We've got sad news this week that the 29th Marine Corps Commandant General Al Gray uh, passed away. Um, well, and you and you uh, and your team covered uh, that. Uh, what were some key changes in the Marine Corps during General Gray's leadership? So General Gray, um, I, I think you know, probably famously came up with the uh, the slogan "Every Marine a Rifleman." Uh, there's a pretty famous morally safer interview with him in 60 minutes, right when he took charge of the Marine Corps in the late eighties, where it's like, Hey, you know, uh, talk, talking to a, a Lance Corporal with a big mustache going like, this is going to get a lot harder. You're going to be in the field a lot more. Um, so general gray, you know, he was a Mustang, right? He, uh, he was a Sergeant, uh, during the Korean war before he, uh, uh commissioned and served, uh, earned a silver star in Vietnam and then uh, moved it on to lead the Marine Corps. And the big thing that he brought uh, leading the Marine Corps was this idea of maneuver warfare. Um, really, really pushing this idea of um, allowing the Marines to uh, move wherever they needed to go, not be stuck in these, these uh, 
kind of fixed battles and and really use the mobility of the service to bring a new dimension of of hit move hit move hit move to the service that's probably uh is um i mean out of the many 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 contributions that general gray made to the marine corps that's probably going to be the most enduring uh leading to uh war fighting uh, the, the war fighting manual field manual number one in the yep. marine corps which is still still a, a revered document to this day it very much is. It's debated, and there's some discussion. There's been discussion in our pages and proceedings about, you know, should it be updated? If so, how? And those are robust discussions. Uh, but uh, you're you're right. That was a uh, sort of seminal document and uh, happened under under General Gray's leadership. And he was 95 years old when he passed away. Uh, beloved leader of the Marine Corps. And so uh, rest in peace, General Gray. Uh, well, Sam, this has been a great conversation. Um, uh, before we sign off, any saved rounds from you? Yeah, so um, uh, I'm glad I'm glad you uh, gave me a shot to, to plug our new newsletter, the USMNU Sea Scroll. Uh, it is an exclusive Naval Institute member benefit. Um, so uh, as we kind of roam around the world, uh, we want to put out stuff so people uh, can get a better understanding of what's going on with the Navy and the Marine Corps and have some objective information and objective reporting. However, uh, you know, Naval Institute members deserve more. Um, so we have uh, put together a weekly newsletter that has a lot of uh, tidbits and stuff from our notebook uh, that don't make it into our reporting. And it's a, it's a really good way to get uh, kind of some cogent analysis and um, some, some stories behind the stories um, for the Naval Institute members. So uh, what's a digital membership? 42 bucks. That seems like a deal to me, Bill. Yep, forty-two dollars is a digital membership for the Naval Institute. Sixty-nine dollars gets you print proceedings plus uh, online. But uh, yeah, that's it's, it was a great initiative by your team, Sam, to to come up with this member-only product, and we're we're very proud of it. Oh, yeah, we're having we're having a good time. That's that's the most important part. Is it's is, is, it's a, it's a lot of fun to put together. Yeah, and it comes out every Thursday. So if you're a member of the Naval Institute. You can get the C Scroll newsletter from the USNI News team, and it'll hit your inbox uh, every Thursday. And it is unique to our members only. Good stuff. All right. Well, my guest today has been Sam Legrone. He's the head of the USNI News team. Sam, informative as always to talk to you. Hope you have a great weekend. Uh, you too. Thanks. Thanks for having me. All right. Today's show was brought to you by Booz Allen. Accelerate today's missions with tomorrow's technologies as the leader in providing AI solutions to the federal government and one of the world's largest cybersecurity providers, Booz Allen advances game-changing capabilities rapidly, ethically, and securely. Learn more at boozallen.com defense. And until next week, remember, victory begins at the Naval Institute.